you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be back in the book of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Last week we took a look at those first nine verses as kind of an introduction to this letter uh, to the churches, uh, plural churches, there in the region of Galatia. Uh, and Paul got right down to the matter at hand when he began writing this letter. Uh, as, as we read it in uh, verse 6, uh, after a, a very short greeting um, of identifying who the writer is and who he's writing to, um, he says, I marvel or I'm astonished that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And he goes on to say that it's not not really a different gospel, but a, but a perverted gospel. It's been distorted. It's had things uh, added to it that, that make it um, impure. And so he's writing uh, because the, the, the Jewish uh, folks that, that have come in behind Paul as he has gone on and ministered in other churches have uh, began instructing the, the people of those churches that, that they need to become Jewish, and then they can become Christians, and then they can serve and follow Christ. And so it was um, salvation uh, with a little bit of legalism added in there that they had to keep and adhere to a set of rules and regulations and traditions uh, firstly, and then become saved. And Paul said that was not the case. And as, as we get into the verses we're going to take a look at today, uh, Paul kind of uh, expounds on his teaching about the, the gospel that he preached to them and how that he uh, received it from, from no one else, uh, that, that there was only one gospel. There is no new gospel, and as we looked at it uh, last time we were together. And he said um, in verse, uh, let's see, in verse 8 and again in verse 9, uh, that, that there would uh, be a curse uh, prayed upon or requested upon those who preach a distorted gospel, those who are uh, intentionally misleading those uh, members of the churches there in Galatia. And so he begins asking uh, a, a, almost a question. Well, it is a question, a couple of questions to be exact, there in verse 10. And he says, for am I now seeking the favor of people or of God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And so he says if, if he was looking to preach that kind of a gospel, if he was looking to please men, if he was looking to, to uphold the traditions of, of men, uh, then he would not be the bondservant or a bondslave of Jesus Christ, meaning that he has attached himself to Christ, that, that as a, a, a bond servant or a bond slave would have been someone who, who had the ability to uh, move about freely and, and to have that kind of freedom, but they, they instead have chosen to attach themselves to someone else and be in subjection to them. And so whenever you read that, uh, particularly in Paul's writing, that's what he's meaning. He had the freedom to choose, and he chose to attach himself to Christ because of the work that Christ had done on his behalf. And so he goes on uh, in verse 11. We're going to read the rest of uh, the chapter, verse uh, 11 through 24. He says, For I would have you know, or I may make, make known to you, brothers and sisters, that the gospel which was preached by me is not of human invention or not from man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former way of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when he who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I may preach him among the Gentiles, 
I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas for Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see another one of the apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. Now what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. But they only kept hearing, the man who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. And so here in these verses, you kind of see Paul lay it out there of, of not only is it, is it not a new gospel, but what he preached was a pure gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not with traditions added into it, not Jesus plus anything else, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The one and only way. And, and he said uh, in verse 10 there that, that he didn't... Uh, he wasn't in it for the business of persuasion. He wasn't there to make friends or, or to pat himself on the back or to make himself known, but, but rather he was there as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And so in, in verse 10, 11, and 12, he kind of gives some more credentials about his authority as an apostle. And that had been in question. We, we learned that in the previous verses. And then in, in the, the verses 13 through 24, he begins to unfold um, something about his story. Almost as if he's going to tell you an autobiography of his life. And he just gives you a small snippet of that in there. He talks about what he did before he met Christ, before he was converted. The fact that he was converted and some of the things that he did after that conversion to kind of prove the legitimacy of his message as the gospel of Christ, his ministry as a bondservant of Christ, and his apostleship as being appointed and, and sent out by Christ himself. And so if you notice there in verse 10 and in verse 12, the word for begins both of those verses. And, and when you see that word in scripture, it's always a term of explanation. It's, it's describing or explaining something that has just been previously mentioned. And so the four introduces the, the, the fact that he's going to justify the severe language that he just had said. And that was that, that there would be a, a, a curse pronounced on those who preached anything other than Jesus. And he said whether it would be an angel from heaven or any other person, uh, let them be accursed or let them uh, be damned. And, and that would just have, have been a, a very strong, uh, very uh, finger-pointing kind of language in that day. Uh, and, and he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And he said, for I, do I now persuade men? So he, he said, if, if I'm here to persuade men or, or to seek um, to please my fellow man, then I should be accursed. But I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And, and he's saying that to, to um, justify the way that he is speaking to them. And in verse 10, uh, it's for the strong language used talking about the curse. And then in verse 12, he uses the word for because he's talking about the gospel that he is preaching. So he uses a strong language and he says, for am I here to please men? And then he says in verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, or I want you to know, I'm here to make it plain to you that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I didn't receive it from a man, neither was I taught it by another man, but it came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now to quote... Uh, a great commentary writer that I enjoy reading, Warren Wiersbe, he says, Paul was not a politician. He was an ambassador. His task was not to play politics, but to proclaim a message. 
And that's how Paul looked at it. He wasn't there to be a statesman. He wasn't there to entertain. He wasn't there to just speak to the dignitaries uh, of the, the local city that he was ministering in on his missionary journey. He was there to see everybody. He was there to tell the message that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he was put in a tomb, he rose on the third day, and now that salvation is available through Jesus Christ. That was the message, and that was why he said he was a bond servant. He, he had felt the calling on his life. And it wasn't just to go to a certain place, or just to a certain city, or just to a certain people group, or just to a certain class of citizen. It was for everybody. And he goes on, and, and, and he talks about uh, the, the things that, that motivated him. It wasn't according to man, it was... It was revealed to him through Jesus Christ. And that's why it was such an important uh, thing for Paul to preach the gospel everywhere that he went. It's because he knew what the gospel had done for him in his life. And if it could change him, knowing what he was and who he was before, it could change someone else in that same impactful way. Paul would like a lot of folks today who was concerned about an approval rating. You know, if you watch the, the evening news, you'll hear that term every single day. The approval rating of the president. The approval rating of Congress. The approval rating of Senate. The approval rating of the governor. The approval rating of your local leaders. Paul wasn't interested in gaining the approval of the citizens of the places that he went to and preached. He was concerned with with gaining the approval and the well done of our Lord and Savior. He wasn't worried about likes or followers or a blue check mark on social media. He was worried about the message of the cross. Chuck Swindoll, who's a great, great preacher, great commentary writer, he says that he was set free from trying to be a people pleaser by this very passage of scripture, verse 10. He says, there was a time in my ministry many years ago when a single verse of scripture jolted me back to a place of confidence, delivering me from the trap of telling a group of influential people what they wanted to hear. I realize now it was a turning point in my leadership pilgrimage from a slave to others to a servant of Christ. It's this passage of scripture here. For am I now seeking the favor of men or God? Am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians 1.10 that, that verse is very impactful in the way that we perceive it today because a lot of times we do things and we see, uh, is anybody looking? Is anybody going to notice? Is anybody paying attention to what I'm doing? Okay. Okay. And Paul says, I'm not here for those okay. things. I'm not here to gain notoriety. I'm not here to, to sit at the head of the table. I'm not here to be given the key to the city. I'm here for the cause of Christ. And Paul, in verse 11, goes on and he seeks to set the record straight. And so verse 10 is the motivation for Paul's ministry. Verse 11 and 12, he talks about the message that he preaches and how he got his message. And he says, I'm seeking to set the record straight, or I want you to know. I want it to be clear, brothers and sisters. The gospel I preach is absolutely not man-made. He didn't invent it, and he didn't alter it. He didn't change it. He just preaches it, proclaims it, and makes it known. In verse 12, Paul said, I didn't receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I read a couple of different commentary writers on this particular verse because I wanted to make sure that, that we get the concept that Paul is communicating here. John Stott said, this is why Paul dared to call the gospel that he preached my gospel. It was not his because he made it up, but because it had been uniquely revealed to him. 
the magnitude of his claim is remarkable. He is affirming that his message is not his message, but it is God's message. That his gospel is not his gospel, but God's gospel. That his words are not his words, but God's words. And so what he's saying is, I'm communicating directly from the originator of the message. The one that the words came from originally. And MacArthur says that, that Paul's receiving of the gospel from Jesus was in contrast to what the Judaizers. If, if you uh, think about what Paul goes on and says in, in uh, the next couple of verses uh, about Judaism, um, Judaism was taught in a religious instruction type of setting. Um, from uh, 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 The rabbi would teach uh, those that are uh, under him, the students, and most Jews didn't actually study the scriptures. They were taught them. They were told what they said. They were told what they meant. They were told how to interpret. And so Paul says he didn't, um, he didn't receive that instruction about the gospel from any man. He wasn't taught it by any rabbi. He wasn't taught it by any scribe. He was a Pharisee, and so he knew uh, uh, the, the earlier parts of the Old Testament and the prophets uh, very well, but that he had been taught that by someone else. And as he spent that time that he refers to uh, in Arabia and, and back in Damascus, he realized how that the the, the, the Old Testament scriptures, as we know it, pointed to Jesus Christ, pointed to the message of salvation. Yeah. And it's through faith that, that those heroes uh, of the Old Testament were saved because they looked forward to the promise of the Savior in Jesus Christ. He was affirming that his message was not his. And then he was um, revealing to them that, that their traditions were not taught in Scripture. That their traditions were, were not always the original message. In fact, Jesus said in Mark 7, 13, you have made the word have no effect. Basically, Jesus said you have nullified the word of God because of your traditions that you have handed down. And so they took the word and they added to it, and it, and it made the word ineffective. Because they focus more on the traditions that they had implemented and, and instituted more than what God had required and asked and said for the folks to do. So moving on into verses 13 and 14, the Galatians knew uh, Paul's former lifestyle. They knew uh, that he had formerly been a persecutor of the church. And, and through his testimony, uh, when he first went there, the, the, the super natural transformation that took place in his life on the road to Damascus after he met Jesus and actually heard Jesus speak to him and, and, and tell him, I have uh, selected you as, as my mouthpiece, as my preacher, as my minister, as, as the one who's going to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And so, you know, only God could change a heart like that. And he says uh, in verse 13, for you have heard of my former conduct how that I persecuted the church beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. He did everything that he could think of to try and stop the advancement of the gospel as a, 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 a Jewish man, as a, as a Pharisee with influence and leadership in his position. And, and he says that he advanced in verse 14, he advanced in, in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries in, in his own nation, being exceedingly zealous for the traditions of the fathers. So only God could change a heart like that. And, and to be zealous means, that, that word means an intense emotion that compels action and implies uh, the energetic pursuit of a, an aim or a devotion to a cause. And so he said, because, because Jesus and the message of the cross didn't line up with what he felt like the Jewish religion was about, he attempted to squash it and to snuff it out. And he did so to the point that he had people locked up in prison. He had people put to death. And he was passionate about stopping the gospel of Christ. 
until he was on his way to Damascus to carry out orders to lock people up, to put them to death, to stop the church. And he met Jesus Christ. Paul's zealous devotion as a Pharisee, as one who wanted to inhibit the growth of the church. It's been said that a man in that mental and an emotional state is in no mood to change his mind. I mean, could you imagine being so devoted to a cause that, that nothing else around you could affect you? We see that a lot in today's culture. People have been misguided and and, and they have been so devoted of themselves and their resources that they're willing to do anything, whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, to advance their cause instead of what the truth actually is. And so a man in that mental and emotional state is in no mood to change his mind or even have it changed for him by men. You can't reason with someone like that. You can't talk any sense into them. They, they've got their mind made up. But only God could reach someone like that, and God did. If you look back, and I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but if you look back to Acts chapter 9, uh, that's where the conversion of Paul takes place as he's traveling on that road to Damascus. And then Paul himself gives his testimony uh, as he's out preaching and teaching and, and even uh, under arrest to dignitaries and authorities in Acts 22 and again in Acts 26. And so the words that we read here from verses um, 17 uh, through 24, um, or even before that, verses uh, 13 through 24, uh, confirm that this letter that Paul has written and the testimony that is reported uh, by Luke in the book of Acts match up. They, 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 that Paul says the things that Luke recorded about him were true. And so when we read Acts we get the idea and, and the message of, of Paul's conversion, and then he repeats it in 22 and, and, and in 26 of Acts. And so it kind of confirms what he's saying to the churches in Galatia here in these verses. But I want to take a look at verse 15 and 16 as, as kind of the key verses of this section that we're looking at this morning. He says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. He didn't immediately run to the church at Jerusalem. He didn't immediately go back to um, the Sanhedrin and the high priest and say, I've heard from Jesus and we got it all wrong, fellas. No, no. He internalized it. And he went and he spent some time. You, you know, the, the days that he was blinded on the road to Damascus to, to the time that, that Ananias came to him and, and, and was instructed by God to lay his hands on him and to give him his sight back. Those days that he was there without any sight, he prayed. And he sought God's wisdom. And he sought God's leadership. And he sought God's voice. To speak to him. And he went and he spent three years in Arabia. Isolated. Not in Jerusalem. Not under the influence of, of the Jewish church. Not under the influence of, of the, the, the apostles and the New Testament church. But alone. Studying the scriptures for himself. Something that he had been taught by a rabbi or someone in authority over him all of his life. He goes and he reads the scripture for himself. And then he says he goes back to Damascus for three more years. And he begins to preach and to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And then he comes back to Jerusalem. And he spends 15 days with Peter. Peter was the main one uh, preaching to the Jewish population. And now Paul's going to be the main one preaching to the non-Jewish population, the Gentile population. <clears throat> and they get together and spend 15 days with each other. 
But in these those two verses, verse 15 and 16, he says, but when? And so up to this point in Paul's life, um, all had been uh, 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 teaching of man and by man. Yeah, he had learned from, from different rabbis and from different priests. But now God has intervened. And everything has changed. And he says that it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. That, that he, he talks about that in his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. Christ speaks to him and says, I have chosen you to carry my message to the Gentiles. Amen, brother. So through his grace, it says, called me through his grace. The basis for God's calling of Paul was grace. Unmerited favor. Unmerited love. Unmerited kindness. So Paul, just like all of us, deserved death. The wages of sin is death. Paul wrote that. But God called him to life. God gave him a message. God gave him a mission. God gave him a ministry. He put him into a life of service as an apostle. One who had received direct instruction from Jesus Christ. And he was to proclaim the life-giving gospel of grace. Not the message of grace plus tradition. Not Jesus and anything else. The message of the cross. By grace. Through faith. The Galatians, as you know, were being bothered by this uh, legalism being taught by the Jewish folks that were coming in behind Paul. And Paul explained that the call of God was a product of that grace. So it wasn't just that they had to become Jewish to become a Christian. God says that the call of grace is there because you don't deserve it. But you get the rewards of it anyway. So it says that it pleased him. These words are connected directly with the words to reveal his son in me. It, it pleased God to reveal Jesus Christ in Paul. Just the same way it pleases God when when we have the gospel preached to us and we realize that we are sinners and we can't do it without him and we repent, that's when we experience grace. The intervention of God in the life of Paul was, was not sought out by him. It wasn't deserved by him. But salvation in its purpose and in its accomplishment was of God, just like with us. And he said... Uh, he used the word reveal. That means to, to, to remove the cover from or to expose. Sometimes we, we know something here, but we don't ever realize it. It's never revealed here until it's time. Until there's a certain moment, that aha moment that we have, where, where our head knowledge and our heart knowledge become one, and we say, you know what, God, you're right. And I'm wrong. And that's where Paul was on that road to Damascus. It was revealed in him. And then he, and he said the, the purpose of that revelation in him was that he might preach the message among the Gentiles. Preach Jesus. And so God supernaturally revealed the truth according to his son in Paul's heart and his mind to express uh, the purpose that he would preach Jesus among the Gentiles. That's what he told him. And that's what Paul's heart was set on fire to do. It was a, the same in its purpose and its accomplishment because Paul set out to do what he'd been called to do. We don't often get on the, the, the gospel train so fast, do we? Well, if that's really what I'm supposed to do, if that's really what you want me to do, God, Paul said to the Corinthians in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he wanted to tell me. And he said, in my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonst demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. Salvation doesn't come intellectually. Salvation comes by grace through faith because of the power of God working in your life. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy, God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and his grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all of eternity. So God desires, God's purpose is for you to experience his grace. It's for you to experience his salvation through Jesus Christ. And so if you look at those two verses, it says that it pleased God. So God did it. And it says that, that he called him through his grace. And so God did it by grace. To reveal his son in me. And God did it. He did it by grace. And he did it through his son, Jesus Christ. It's the same operation for us. God's the one who saves us. God does it by his grace. And he does it through his son, Jesus Christ. Look at the last verse, verse 24. He goes on and he talks about in those uh, verses 17 through uh, 23, the, the places that he had gone to preach, how that he would spent that time uh, in, in Arabia and then Damascus. And then he goes and, and he, he meets up with Peter for 15 days. And then he goes out on his missionary journey. And he says that the, 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 the people in the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, they just heard about me. They never saw me. I never preached there. That was Peter's mission field. But he says in, in verse 23, they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith that he once tried to destroy and it says in the last verse of chapter 1, and they glorified God in me, or because of me. The word glorifying carries the idea of over and over and over they were glorifying God. So not only was it a relief that he's not persecuting the church, but now he's a Christian and he's carrying the message. So the influence and the zeal and the passion that he had that you can see that, that we took a look at last week, the passion for the gospel was now pushing the gospel forward and getting it out instead of trying to snuff it out and squash it down. And they were glorifying God. Again, Chuck Swindle said, to give glory to God is to believe in him and to regard him as the only wise, righteous, merciful, and almighty God. It means Acknowledging him as the only source and the donor of every good and perfect gift. Isn't that what salvation is? A good and perfect gift that we don't deserve. But yet God, because of his love, has revealed himself to us. Worshiping God is nothing else than glorifying God. And glorifying God is to be the chief aim of of every Christian. So just like Paul, Saul to Paul, there will be a noticeable difference when a person repents of their sin and accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior. And just as there was evidence in the life of Saul, Paul, and the fact that Jesus Christ has given him a message, a mission, and a ministry speaks that we have that too. We don't always fulfill our obligation. Paul took it as a lifetime appointment. And that's what he did until the day that his physical life ended on this earth was proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when someone experiences salvation because of the, the, the preaching of the word and, and the telling of the gospel story, 
and they experience salvation and they make it known to other people in a public way, God is glorified because the message goes on and on and it reaches out and reaches out and reaches out. God did it. God's the one who saves. He did it by his grace through faith. He saves by grace through faith. And he did it through Jesus Christ. And it's only through him that we can have that salvation. If, if Paul were to have written a hymn, I think it would sound a lot like hymn number four in the Baptist hymn. Take a look at that with me real quick. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes. That's what he referred to himself as. That moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he has done. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for the great things that you have done on our behalf through Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for the message of the cross, for the mission uh, to reach people, and for uh, the ministry 